and the feelings that he projected onto public figures. And that is what you have to study to understand the Kennedy assassination. Using his mail-order rifle, Oswald fired at General Walker, who was sitting inside his house. The bullet was deflected by the window frame. The world didn't know any of this until after Oswald died. This was entirely on his own. There wasn't anybody that he worked with. Nobody knew about it except Marina, and she was keeping very quiet. Marina told me that she was in fear all the time of what he might do. After the Kennedy assassination, Marina spent weeks being interviewed by FBI agent Wally Heitman. Lee Harvey was on his route then. He, it seems to me, was determined that in order to, to make himself somebody, he was going to have to assassinate somebody, and that somebody would have to be big. They subsequently went to New Orleans, and one of the principal reasons that they went to New Orleans was that Marina thought that if she could get Lee Harvey out of Dallas, that maybe he would not have all of these strange ideas. But returning to his birthplace only fueled his political activism. New Orleans was teeming with thousands of anti-Castro Cubans. Oswald launched a one-man pro-Castro campaign. He became the New Orleans chapter of the National Fair Play for Cuba Committee. He stood out enough that local television filmed him handing out leaflets. In August, he was arrested after fighting with anti-Castro Cubans. Again, he stood out. He appeared on television answering questions about Cuba. In your work with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee, uh, what are you advocating? We advocate restoration of diplomatic, trade, and tourist relations with Cuba. And are you a Marxist? Well, I have uh, studied Marxist philosophy, yes, sir, and also other philosophers. But the attention was fleeting, and his composure in public masked the turmoil in his private life. Marina was pregnant again, and they were living on unemployment benefits. In September, Lee tried to convince Marina to help him hijack a plane to Cuba. A Russian woman who came, hardly speak English, with a baby in tow uh, to hijack a plane. She thought that was the craziest idea that she had ever heard. She was able to convince him that that just would not work. In late September, Marina went back to Texas with Ruth Payne. Lee and Marina would never live together again. Lee seemed very sad when we drove off. So I, I thought he cared. It's just that he didn't didn't really know how or, or, or nothing would seem to be working well for him. Lee's life leading up to November of 1963 was just a series of disappointments. He'd had very boring jobs. He'd barely been able to support a wife and children. And he figured he'd run out his strength. Lee had told Marina that he really wanted to help the Cuban Revolution. He went to the Cuban consulate in Mexico City, but they didn't want it. to the Soviet embassy and asked to return to Russia. They turned him down as well. He thought he himself was interesting enough and important enough that they would give him visas to go to their country. And he was rebuffed. In a way, this cut him off his last exit, in a way. And when he left Mexico City to go back to Dallas, he... He went in a spirit of defeat and desperation. Oswald arrived back in Dallas, where Marina was living, on October the 3rd. He had no job and no prospects. He rented a room for $8 a week and looked for work. It was Ruth Payne who arranged for him to get a job at the Texas School Book Depository. He started work on the 16th of October. On November the 19th, the route of the Kennedy motorcade was published in the Dallas newspapers. The route went right past the building where Oswald had a job. On November the 21st, the night before the assassination, Lee visited Marina at Ruth Payne's house. It was the only time he'd ever arrived unannounced.
one of the things he did when he left that Friday morning was put most of the money that he had on the dresser for Marina with a little note, get some shoes for Junie. And then he took off his ring and put it in a cup. Uh, and I have wondered, I think, he, I think he was pretty depressed and discouraged about how things weren't going well for him. He wasn't changing the world or whatever it was he thought he was supposed to be doing. He had problems at home. He had problems on his job. He was completely frustrated about what was going on around him. This is not excusing what he did. This is understanding what he did. He wanted to be somebody. And this opportunity came about. Coincidental. Nothing planned. Nothing organized. It happened that way. It's one of those happenstances of history. Oswald went to work at the book depository on the morning of the 22nd, carrying a long object wrapped in brown paper. He told another worker it was curtain rods. was finally somebody. Did you call the president? No, I have not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. When I saw him there, he looked like the cat that swallowed the canary. But he was, he was proud of what he had done. Throughout that weekend, Oswald was questioned by the police, the FBI, and the Secret Service. He wasn't admitting anything. His brother Robert went to see him in custody. I'm looking into his eyes. I'm looking for some sign. Something. He said, brother, you won't find anything there. And he was absolutely right. There was nothing there. There was no emotion that you could see. Whatsoever. Even without a confession, the district attorney Henry Wade said he'd a strong case. I figure we have sufficient evidence to convict. Was this a case that this was an organized plot or was it just yes, one man? We had no one else but him. That would never be tested in court. Now, this is the armored truck that will carry Lee Oswald from the basement here of Dallas Police Headquarters downtown to the Dallas County Jail. On Sunday, November the 24th, the press had been told they could cover Oswald's transfer from police headquarters to the county jail and to be at the basement loading dock by 10 a.m. Captain stepped me to handcuff Oswald's uh, right arm to my left arm. While I was doing all this, I said to him in jest more than anything else, I said, Lee, if anybody shoots at you, I hope there's as good a shot as you are, meaning, of course, it hit him and not me. He kind of laughed, and he said, oh, you're being melodramatic or something out of fact, so nobody's going to shoot at me. Yeah, there is a uh, He's been shot. He's been shot. He has, well, has been shot. I pulled a while of Roberto and tried to pull him behind me, but I was too close to him to move him. So I turned his body so that the bullet, instead of it hitting him dead center, it hit him about four inches to the left of the middle. It was like a cartoon almost, where you see a foot there and a hand there and a gun there and a head there. And, and it was a little scary, but but very fast, he was down. And I didn't know who it was. I didn't know for probably five minutes who it was. And then when I found out, I thought, oh my God, I know that man. And I'm not really that surprised. <laughs> 